This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. In 1636, Lady Elizabeth Powlett presented the University of Oxford with two needlework panels of our own making. These portrayed the birth, death, resurrection and ascension of our Saviour. Although the embroidery itself is no longer extant, responses to it were recorded in six poems composed by members of New College, including its then-chaplain, Ralph Brydoak. These poems were inscribed as a collection in a presentation manuscript, whilst individual poems were copied into other contemporary manuscripts and print miscellanies. Combined with the poem's references to the numerous viewers that the embroidery attracted, they indicate that Powlett's work received considerable attention from a scholarly as well as more public audience. These poems are steeped in the language of smiles, cries, delight and love, and reveal that Powlett's work was experienced as an intensely emotional and emotive gospel, whose capacities both to depict and to prompt strong religious feelings outstripped those of the pen and the paintbrush. William Cartwright, prominent university wit and future clergyman, neatly captured Powlett's vividly and intrinsically emotional rendering of her subject. He punningly observes the postures of grief so true that we may swear your artful fingers have wrought passion there. The embroidery of Christ's passion is also a stirring of the passions of the human body. The passions were the dominant theory of the emotions in this period, according to which the whole body feels itself moved, not only inwardly, but also outwardly. Feelings were as much bodily as um, cognitive experiences. Their embodied operation has received much scholarly attention in recent years, most notably, Gail Kern Pastor has stressed that the passions figure emotion as a psychophysiological and environmentally involved phenomenon. Engendering humoral changes, feelings like grief were experienced and physically felt in and through the body and its transactions with the material world as much as they were in the mind. The passions thus offer a key means of bringing together ideas of sensation, perception, cognition and emotion which enable us to understand how Palette's embroidery could both materialise the emotions of the figures it depicted, as well as work on the hearts, bodies and minds of its viewers. In this paper, I use the poems about Palette's work to reveal how embroidery was understood as a highly emotional medium which was capable of prompting strong religious feelings. Like its scholarly audience, I pay close attention to the emotional content of threads, tools and techniques to reveal how pain and joy were experienced as much in perception of material content as in pictorial detail. In a period when embroideries depicted old rather than New Testament scenes largely, Powlett's choice of subject combined with the rich emotive and sensuous language used to describe it might make us wonder if it is crypto-Catholic. These suggestions are registered but ultimately refuted in several of the poems. Rather, as I demonstrate in the second part of this paper, Paulette's work and the scholar's poems open us up to how richly feeling certain modes of Protestant piety continued to be. Actively working upon the devotional sensibilities of her scholarly audience, Paulette's work offers an especially powerful and well-documented example of the emotional and theological opportunities produced through women's needlework. At the same time, comparison with contemporaneous embroideries, such as this mid-century depiction of the nativity, suggests that other needlewomen were engaging with similar issues and that stitchery was widely considered to be an effective prompt to and um, to direct emotion. According to early modern theories, the passions were physically lodged in the heart and acted on the body through the movement of the blood. The heart dilated with joy and constricted in pain and anguish, drawing the blood away from the limbs. For Edward Dalby, these passionate motions were discoverable in the material behaviours of Paulette's threads. Attending to Christ's crucifixion, Dalby declares, See how he faints, the crimson silk turns pale, changing its grain. Manifesting an emotional constriction so extreme that it overwhelms the body, Christ's fainting is enacted in Paulette's work through the active properties of the fading crimson silk. Such material changes should be understood not simply as analogous to the motions of the passions within the human body, but as co-equal interactants. Correspondences between the micro and macrocosm meant that emotions were understood not simply as uniquely self-contained qualities um, of the human body, rather, as Pasteur notes, they, quote, participated in the fluctuations and variations characteristic of phenomenal life in general. 
the thread's emotional correspondences um, with fainting passions are underscored by the use of crimson to describe not only red fabric, but also something of or relating to the blood, and hence sanguine. Seen within a culture where particular colours had distinct humoral and passionate qualities, Paulette's fading threads materialised the active emotional life of her work. Ralph Breiduck also discovers congruities between the human body and needlework tools, which suggests that the emotional content of Paulette's work is created in and by her materials. Viewing the nativity, Breiduck presents the stable as the emblem of the world, a veil of tears, before noting that Christ's quote, trickling tears along his cheeks have crept, as if, in, as if indeed the needle's eye had wept. Breidoke's reversible metaphors render human emotions material and figure the needle's streaming thread as the outpouring of a passionately moved object, emphasising the interde- interdependence of fabric and corporeal emotion. Breidoke elaborates this reciprocal exchange as he, changed, uh, as he turns to the ascension, highlighting how ideas of sympathy enable the embroidery to transmit as well as to materialise emotion. He observes, quote, the men of Israel with amazed eyes gaze on their saviour mounting through the skies, declaring, see, the needle here has taught the crowd um, with eager eyes to prosecute the cloud. Their hands are palsy struck, their eye strings break. Recalling the heart strings which controlled its constriction and dilation, these breaking eye strings evoke Psalm 139, which described the body as curiously wrought or embroidered, suggesting a correspondence between stitch tension and the tensions of the human body the highly strung crowd emphasise how the passions worked upon and through the literal fibres of human bodies. Dalby also picks up the figure of the weeping needle, embedding it within a more extended consideration of the emotional equivalence of cloth and tears, which seeks to move beyond metaphor. Capitalising upon ideas that women's watery humours made them more inclined to pit- mercy and pity, Dolby situates Paulette within a Christian tradition of female models of devotion and suggests that Paulette's own passions might be registered in and prompt those of her embroidery. He notes, Christ's pensive handmaids take him, da- take him from the tree, embalming him with tears. None could express, madam, but you, grief in so fit a dress. No hand but yours could teach a needle's eye to drop t- true tears unfeignedly to cry. The fit dress of grief here offers a crucial link which establishes the emotional and material consistency of Christ's weeping handmaids and the handiwork performed through Paulette's passionate dialogue with her materials. Thomas Wright's 1604 treatise, Passions of the Mind, which has formed the basis of a much recent scholarship on the passions, dedicated an entire chapter to the discovery of the passions by external actions. Here, he positioned habits of dress alongside the motions of hand, voice, and eye. Eliding emotional boundaries between human and material bodies, the literal fabric of the passions suggests that the tears and threads were perceived as coextensive in their emotional content. In its turn, needlework, as Bright Oak reflects, offers our hearts a lesson, stirring the passions of its scholarly audience. Protestants understood the emotions as prompts to good works and as both aids to and evidence of divine revelation. Consequently, theologians devoted much energy to detailing how to summon passions that were not always forthcoming. In a culture which, according to Alec Ryrie, was more alarmed by the absence of emotion than its success, the strong feelings inspired by Paulette's work would have offered a potent aid to devotion. Evoking Cartwright's attention to the true postures of grief, Bride Oak grounds the embroidery's power to move in its vivid materiality. This accords with rhetorical concepts of Energia, which held that the most realistic works were the most moving. He notes that the cross and nails seem wood and steel indeed. Trust me, they'll make a stony heart to bleed. The wreath of thorns is so plaited on his crown. Had I not feared the pricks, I had pulled it down. Using the acutely fibrous texture of the plaited thorns to allude to the pricks of the needle, Bride Oak seems to position Paulette's tools as divine objects. This effective devotion to the instruments of the passion seems to bespeak um, semi-Catholic impulses, together with their, um, particularly given their stigmatic-like effects. The poems often seem to teeter between participating in and disparaging the material and sensual worship prompted by Paulette's work. 
several articulate anxieties about the crypto-Catholic yearnings um, that Paulette's relic-like work might inspire. Brideoak, for example, claims that the depiction of the virgin and child, so far my zeal misled, had no man seen, I had kissed and worshipped. Yet Brideoak ultimately emphasises that Paulette and her work serve the Protestant cause, concluding that the Jesuits' only hope is by some trick to make this Protestant turn Catholic. Definitions of Protestantism Protestantism were particularly vexed in the 1630s when William Lord, as Archbishop of Canterbury, placed an increased emphasis on material beauty and ceremony in Anglican worship, including the use of nativity and passion imagery. Although for some Puritans this exposed his Catholic sympathies, recent work has uncovered the use of similar imagery, materials and ceremonies by English Protestants throughout the Reformation. As Peter Lake emphasises, the Laudian style of worship was distinctive less in terms of its individual components than its agglomeration of them. Other women apparently used embroidery to engage directly with Laud. Among the charges levelled at him during his trial for popery in the 1640s was that he had a Bible with the five wounds of Christ fair upon the cover of it, which was curiously wrought in needlework. Christ's wounds were central to medieval rituals of effective piety and had been used as symbols of Catholic resistance. Nevertheless, Lord asserted that the book had been, quote, sent me by a lady and she a Protestant. At Oxford University, where Lord was Chancellor, numerous college chapels were redecorated in the 1630s with windows and painted hangings depicting nativity and passion scenes. A poem commenting on those at Magdalene and Christ College College Christ Church College offers a parallel with the verses written in response to Paulette's work. Comparisons were further suggested by the latter's reference to Paulette's work teaching, quote, dull painters to paint a tear, indicating that her works contemplated alongside and as superior to the works of professional male artisans. This challenges us to rethink the gendered confines within which early modern women's needlework now tends to be considered. Exploiting the obligations of patronage, display and gift giving, her work actively shaped Anglican experiences as emotion in cultures of scholarly and public debate from which women are now conventionally seen as having been excluded. In what follows, I locate Paulette's work in the emotional and sensual environment of 1630s Lordism, at the same time as registering its resonance with Protestant practices which were temporally and doctrinally more extended. At the heart of Lordism was an emphasis on the necessary embodiment of spiritual emotion and the correspondences between the spiritual and somatic senses, subjects about which English Protestantism had long been ambivalent. According to early modern theories of the passion, their corporeal basis meant that they were primarily excited by and literally entered the body through the senses. Reformist doctrine tended to try to work upon the reason and ostensibly advanced a more abstracted understanding of the inner spiritual stances, denying the validity of those of the body. Yet, as scholarship is increasingly demonstrating, the supposedly material and sensual austerity of Protestantism was often absent both in practice and in theory. Worshippers continued to seek sensate devotion, whilst reformist treatises often re-embodied the senses even as they sought to abstract them. Joseph Mashenska's recent analysis of touch proves particularly pertinent to the feelings elicited by Paulette's embroidery. He argues that from its inception, the English Reformation sought to, quote, obscure the very distinction between literal and figurative language, and that the material sensuality advocated by Lord and his predecessors needs to be understood as growing out of this hinterland between physical and metaphorical conceptions of divine contact. Paulette's work seems situated in this hinterland, As Samuel Evans observes in his poem, the embroidery was kept behind glass. Nevertheless, the poems repeatedly yearn for direct (coughs) contact, figuring emotional responses in haptic terms. Like Brideoak, several respondents seize upon the lifelike instruments of the passion. Evans feels the, quote, nails and the thorns so keen, um, a term describing both material sharpness and intense emotional states. Darby's description of Christ's crown as, quote, so acute, possessed similar connections. He also desires that he who thinks not that the thorns indeed, would he were pricked until his fingers bleed. Um, Darby's image resonates with Brideoak's bleeding heart and suggests that the belief that, and, and speaks to the belief that, quote, the passions inhibit, inhabit, sorry, not only the heart, 
but also are stirred up in every part of the body, whereas any sensitive operation is exercised. Paulette's vivid portrayal seems to drive these haptic impulses, confirming Mashenska's claim that realistic artworks actively demanded to be touched. This resonates with Aristotelian ideas that the object possessed primary agency in sensory perceptions and suggests how, through her sensual embroidery, Paulette might forcibly act upon the observer's devotional sensibilities. Other embroideries seem to register similar tensions about um, haptic devotion. This 1639 Geneva Bible was wrought by Anne Cohn Wallace. As Amanda Pullen has suggested, while Stan's family lineage contained recusants, uh, the anti-papal, anti-papal Geneva Bible suggests that the book did not necessarily represent an expression of Catholic faith. The back cover shows a border of instruments of the Passion. The central image shows the resurrected Jesus declaring to Mary Magdalene, Noli me tangere. At the same time as this scene forbids touch, Mary Magdalene's washing of Christ's feet meant that she was also seen as authorising physical experiences of faith. Her appeal as a model of effective piety is evident in other extant embroideries, including this 1636 copy of Private Devotions. The book itself also demanded to be handled physically and intellectually, again emphasising the agency of the object in articulating sensual imperatives. Embroidered bindings were popular during the 17th century and several several examples depict scenes from the life of Christ, suggesting that book bindings might have offered a particularly apt site for exploring how the reformed word might be read in conversation with sensate devotion. The material composition of Cornwallis's binding also seems to encourage palpable piety. Like many examples, it combined proverbially soft silks with sparkling silver wires and spangles, which not only caught the eye, but offered stimulating textural variety. Some figures, like the scourge, also um, included raised work, popular during this period, to build up a three-dimensional and lifelike simulation which moved hand and heart alike. For Thomas Gowan, later Catholic convert, Paulette's work provoked provoked meditation on the piercing affected through the needle itself. Observing, quote, what punctual thorns here crown the crucifix, unquote, he comments, I, quote, fought on your needle, but your silk more pricks. He similarly imagines Paulette, quote, pinning down the hands and feet before concluding, the stitch is very a nail. Gowan ultimately suggests that Paulette's vivid depiction makes her work especially moving. Nevertheless, when read in the context of the weeping needle, his invocation of the piercing tools of embroidery suggests that the emotive stitches might be considered indexical traces of instruments which pricked hearts, fingers, and cloth. Bleeding fingers offer particularly visceral examples of how sensations could be stirred up in the blood. According to Wright, though, the passions were especially stirred by sight. The embroidery's power to move the eye and the emotions is registered in the poem's plentiful imperatives to, quote, view this active passion, look on Christ's scarlet ground, and see his weeping handmaids. Such visual devotion could suggest heresy. For John Beasley, even, quote, the precisest, i.e. the strictest Puritan, tempted is to spy and seek a guilt of sweet idolatry. Again, suggesting how the dynamics of sensory perception could grant Paulette's embroidery agency over its viewers. Beasley's, reflect- Beasley's reflection also speaks to Protestants' continuing attraction to graphic representations of Christ's death. Passion prints remained readily available throughout the Reformation, whilst the readiness of congregations to weep at preachers' quote, scenical representations of the crucifixion scene um, was a commonplace by the beginning of the 1630s. William Cartwright took a more positive view of embroidery's optical agency, declaring, quote, Nor can the style be profanation when the needle may convert more than the pen, when faith may come by seeing, and each leaf, rightly perused, prove gospel to the deaf. This last line evinces a more complex relation between word and image in which reading becomes a mode of seeing. Speaking to contemporary antagonism uh, between the need to hear the word and the need to read it, Cartwright suggests that Paulette's work is more moving than even the most passionate preacher. For Brydoak, a feeling of wondrous revelation is prompted as much by the sight of Paulette's skilled handiwork 
as the figures it depicted. In terms which prefigure the, the Israelites' amazed gaze, he reflects, quote, We gaze and see, and in each thread admire a mystery. He directs us particularly to, ob, quote, Observe the circumplex twists and the colours that, quote, Change and vary in each stitch. This attention to individual stitches and techniques posits a mode of sense perception less prone to charges of idolatry, perhaps, and indicates that even non-iconographic embroideries could work upon the sensibilities of their users. Read alongside other references to the passions which inhered in and were provoked by embroiderers' materials and tools, it suggests that less obviously controversial embroideries than those I have been discussing here might similarly be understood as producing and directing material passions. As well as highlighting the particularly influential position occupied by Paulette's work, these poems, then, ask us to reconsider our perception of early modern embroidery more generally and to rethink the context in which the emotional content of women's biblical needlework made itself felt.